April 15th, 2015. It started just like any other day for me, and for most of us in this room, it was probably a pretty non-remarkable day. For me, I woke up in my apartment in San Francisco, looked out the window, and saw the sun shining in through the Golden Gate Bridge. I went on to check my phone, as we all do in our digital worlds, and I saw that something wasn't quite right. I had a flood of messages from people asking if my friends and family in Kathmandu, Nepal, were okay. Overnight, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake had struck the small Central Asian country, destroying hundreds of thousands of homes and claiming thousands of lives. The vibrations that I was feeling on my phone mirrored a much more of tragic vibration on the other side of the world. I was immediately confused, and I was saddened, and I was in despair. I wanted to help, I wanted to do something, but really I didn't know what to do. I started looking around online and trying to think about what to do. And I remember reading an article in the BBC specifically saying not to travel to Nepal to provide aid. And talking to my parents, they also provided a similar message. I would be another mouth to feed in an already chaotic situation, and I would be running straight into the fire. At that point, my life in San Francisco was privileged by pretty much every measure, if not too privileged. I was making more money than I really knew what to do with, and I was working as a data head for private sector technology companies. So over the next week, I was thinking about, you know, I have this life that I sort of enjoy what I do, but I don't find it particularly fulfilling, and I feel like there's a situation here where I can go out and help and do something that's more meaningful. Weighing the pros and cons, I inevitably fell back on a decision-making pattern that I've noticed throughout my life. If something is offered to me as being reckless and ill-advised, that's usually when I jump, head in, jump in head first and go ahead and do it. And of course, for that, I'll apologize to my mom, who is here somewhere. I think it's here back there. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, over the next week, I started to gather camping supplies and medical supplies. And beyond anything else, I gathered myself to take a leap of faith. Before I knew it, I had arrived in Kathmandu, Nepal, a city that I had been to numerous times before. Stepping out of the plane, I immediately felt something was different. The people were different, the, the uh, air was different. It was almost as if the shift of the tectonic plates had shifted more than just the country's topography, but it also shifted its energetic feel. At the airport, I saw a makeshift sign talking about coordination meetings for the humanitarian community that was providing aid to this crisis. Not really knowing what these were because, you know, my life in the US was anything but humanitarian. I started going around to these meetings and hearing what organizations were doing to provide aid to those who had been impacted by the earthquake. Organizations were talking about how many schools had been damaged in different parts of the country, or how they could provide food to those who were in need when their villages were inaccessible because roads had literally fallen off the side of a mountain. Throughout these meetings, I started to notice some common trends. Organizations were saying that they needed platforms to visualize data. Some were saying they had too much data. Some were saying they didn't have enough data. I really didn't quite make, it didn't really quite make sense to me, but I knew there was a common thread here, which was that information seemed to be a really central part of the response. I continued my trek through Kathmandu and eventually found myself at the United Nations compound. It was a pretty big compound, and at this point, it had really turned into a city of tents. And in these tents were humanitarian responders from around the world. And as I went around the compound and just started talking to people, one thing that, you know, in general was quite surprising to me about this experience was that the general world of the humanitarian response community is quite open. I, myself, who has no affiliation, just showed up, walked in, and said, hey guys, I'm here. <laughs> the first thing was, great, who are you? And then I told them that I could code, I was a data scientist, and sort of before I knew it, I was sitting down in a tent next to some people I'd just met, and I was doing exactly what I'd been doing since I was a teenager, which was coding. And to me, it was totally crazy because, you know, I'd left the US in this Rambo-like mindset that I've got my construction gloves, medical supplies, I'm gonna go do something in Nepal, I don't know what. But then here I was like working on Excel sheets and Google Sheets and it's just really strange the way that life unfolds sometimes. And this moment was definitely no exception. 
As I got into working with the team I was with, our main focus was around helping to inform the general global humanitarian response in terms of what the priorities were for the response. So of course, there's a very large earthquake, scores of houses have been destroyed, but where in the country were, were the biggest impacts seen and what kind of relief was needed? These were the questions that we were trying to answer. And in order to do this, we are sifting through vast amounts of qualitative or secondary data. Now what this means in a more practical sense is that news organizations, social media, and international aid agencies were all producing tons of text data. And really it was just too voluminous in order to really get a good grasp on and do anything meaningful for it. The best metaphor I can think of for how to describe this is that imagine you're in our shoes trying to figure out what's going on in a humanitarian context. And someone points you to a room. And in this room, you have boxes from floor to ceiling full of papers. And in these papers, you might have information from a decade ago, or there might be information from a couple weeks ago. But on, the, on these different pieces of paper, they all could contain vital information telling you about what kind of assistance is needed in different parts of the country. So it's our job with our team of humanitarian experts to go through all this metaphorical boxes and come up with information to provide to responders saying where they should focus their efforts. The team was there and the effort was there, but really what I noticed was lacking was a good data system in order to manage this information. As I mentioned before, what was being used was really just Google Sheets and Excel Sheets. I'm sure most of us in here have worked with either one of these tools before, and while they're useful, you know, they're not always the solution for everything. And I started to notice that really Excel Sheets were the go-to standard for the international humanitarian community. And this really shocked me. I thought this would be a very well-oiled machinery, and in some senses it certainly was, but it definitely wasn't in terms of how they were storing and processing information. I continued on with this work for about another month, and fueled by this curiosity and this drive that I had to help the international humanitarian community process and store information, I returned to my apartment in San Francisco, packed up all my stuff, and then returned back to Nepal. I lived the, and moving back to Nepal is where I lived for the next several years and continued on this, this thread of curiosity that I had. Because of the magic of the TEDx stage, we can fast forward to today, six years later. And honestly, it's quite surreal to be standing here on stage and talking about this experience. In some ways, it feels just like yesterday, but in other ways, it feels like decades ago. Since then, myself and those around me have fostered a global team of humanitarian experts, ranging from document annotators to user interface designers and programmers, focusing solely on this task of helping the global humanitarian community to store process information in ways that make humanitarian aid more efficient and more accurate and more timely. One of the main ways we've done this is through development of a tool called Deep, which you can think of as a more mechanized way for extracting information from all those boxes of papers. Through the development of Deep, we're starting to develop a, a consolidated place where humanitarian organizations can do this process of information extraction and can collaborate with one another. DEEP has been used in a variety of contexts, be it from the tracking the spread of Ebola in West Africa to monitoring human rights in Southeast Asia. DEEP and our work came squarely into focus with the emergence of COVID in 2020. As I'm sure we can all relate, day-to-day -day lives were impacted and disrupted in countless ways, and this was true for the humanitarian community. One of the main ways this, we saw this impact was in terms of how information was collected during a humanitarian response. I've talked about reviewing all those information in those boxes of paper, but another way that the humanitarian community gathers information is in a more direct manner, which is just going around to people in need and asking them about what sort of assistance they may need. So do you have reliable access to drinking water? How long does it take you to walk to a market to buy food? And by gathering this information, they can start to ascertain which parts of a country may be the highest priority for assistance and what type of assistance should they provide. Now, as you can imagine with COVID, 
this face-to-face -face interaction became limited, if not impossible. So how are you going to get the information you need to know what sort of assistance to deliver? And the solution here is that deep in this process of sorting through all those giant metaphorical boxes of paper became all the more important. And in fact, we had teams of dozens of annotators and document extractors around the world that were working on this problem in four different languages. And frankly, we were barely scratching the surface of what needed to be done. The volume of text and qualitative data may seem trivial, but it, provide, but it shows real issues to the international humanitarian community. Right now, the process of trying to tame this beast is indeed quite manual. But in the future, we're currently working on solutions to automate this through natural language processing and artificial intelligence. I'm humble enough to know that I'm not going to solve everything, and no one individual person can solve every issue with the humanitarian community. But I think we found our niche, and this is something that we're going to keep pursuing until it doesn't make sense to pursue anymore, or a better solution has been found. Reflecting back on the six years that I've been doing this, I think the unfortunate reality is that looking into the future, there will be an unwavering amount of humanitarian crises that will continue to plague the Earth. The despair and turmoil from these crises that impacts the world's most needy and vulnerable is something of a never-ending crash of waves. And simply because the waves never stop, it doesn't mean that we can't each as individuals wade into the waves for a period of time and save those who are drowning. So my final thought for you this evening is, what does that mean for you? How can you step into the waves and help those who are drowning, be it across the globe or simply across the street? Thank you.